For example, say you have a solid grounding in category theory, how on earth do you explain something to someone if they don't know what you're talking about? Uh, so I'm going to talk about some strategies for working out how to cater for that problem and to get out of your own head a bit. Um, third problem, uh, even if you know what you want to write about and what angle you want to take, uh, some people also just find the writing bit of this very difficult. So I'm going to go through some specific strategies that will just make writing more effective and more user-friendly um, so people can use your jobs better. I'm also going to cover two more problems, kind of briefly, which are more practical problems. Uh, the first one around setting documentation up in the Haskell ecosystem. Where do you put your documentation? Where does it live? And the second one around maintenance, as in you've written some documentation, but how do you make sure it doesn't break and you keep it up to date? Uh, okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and I also want to briefly cover some principles that are kind of going to guide us along the way. Um, so these are three things that I'm going to come back to a lot. First one is I'm going to go on and on about users. I apologize for this in advance. But that's because users are kind of the point of documentation. And focusing on what um, your users is what is going to allow you to write documentation well. Second point is minimalism, or writing only what is necessary. I don't want you to write docs for the sake of writing docs. It's much better, like if it's not useful to anyone, there's no point in putting something together. So it's also, uh, so minimalism is something that I very much go for, apart from anything else, it's much better to start with something minimal and get feedback on whether or not it's working than massively second guess and write you know, 200 pages of stuff and realize you've taken the wrong approach. Um, third one related to that. This talk is not about aiming for like, perfection or even really high excellence in documentation. And that's because it's really difficult to work out what excellent docs are. Like, I can't tell you how to write great documentation for your specific thing because I don't know. And it's quite a long process of working out what really great looks like. But taking, on the other hand, taking something from totally non-existent or really kind of terrible to decent and effective, that's quite achievable. It's just that next step to get to really high that's really hard. Um, so, I mean, if this goes super well, then maybe we can do another advanced se session on once you've covered all the basics, how you get documentation amazing, but for now, focusing on all of this basic stuff is what's going to make a real difference. Okay, enough preamble. Problem number one. So, you want to write some documentation, but what does that even mean? Where do you, what do you actually need to cover to do that? Um, who's come across the term user needs before? Hands up. Is this something that's familiar to people? Okay, not so much. It's, I mean, it's fairly self-explanatory, but it's basically the idea that you have users and you need to work out, given the system that you're providing them, what it is they need from that in order to do something effective for them. Um, so with documentation, the easiest way to start with this is to think about what your user is trying to get done. Uh, you might not know necessarily exactly what their area is or exactly what their application is about, but if you have no idea what they're trying to use your library for, you will find it incredibly hard to write documentation because you can't target it to be useful. Um, this, is, this is a question that I find really helpful and use all the time when working out what documentation is needed. So what do users need to know, what information do they need uh, to complete their task? Um, by tasks, I mean these are the things that they're trying to achieve with your piece of software. So, for example, uh, every person who is starting to use your thing will have a task which is, how do I get set up with this thing? So the getting started area um, usually you know, involves, they need to install it, they need to achieve that successfully, and often need to understand how to use the basics so they can start using it. Um, this area, this task, is probably the most important one to focus on if your documentation isn't great right now. Because A, because everyone has to do this, and B, because it's the area that you'll lose most people. Uh, if you don't lose them completely, you'll lose their best attention. Like, think back to a time that you were trying to install something and trying to get it set up on your machine, and it was a real pain, and you finally get through it. Like, how much attention and, and like, patience do you have left to actually use the thing? It's often not very much. So if you want people to have like their best brain available to you, especially if you've got something quite complicated you want them to do after setup, it's really important to make that first task as easy as possible. So one task is getting started um, and that initial basic usage. 
Um, after that, you need to work out what other kinds of tasks your users might be trying to achieve with your software. So, uh, for example, this is from Shake, a Haskell build system. It has some of the tasks that it documents are defining targets and defining rules. So these are examples of tasks. Um, another one, again, these, you'll notice these are verbs, these are doing words. These are things that someone is trying to achieve and you're telling them how to do it. So this is why they're labeled like this. Um, however, the thing that can be confusing about focusing on tasks is often when you think of software documentation, you're probably thinking of a reference, you know, every single function and what it means. And you might think that that's not very much to do with tasks. But actually it really is. So if you think about, you have to ask yourself, why is it that people are using reference information? Because that is based around tasks too. Normally, there are two tasks. So either they're trying to remember how it is to use something, looking up the specific syntax that they need to use, or they're trying to find out what something is for, and whether or not this is there effectively the task is evaluating something to see if it's appropriate. Um, so crucially, the things that are not relevant here is it's, if you're trying to provide reference information that's relevant to that task, you realize you don't need to talk about things like why you made this design decision in the first place, or things like how this is implemented internally if it doesn't actually, if it's not actually relevant to how you're going to use it. Um, here's an example so of some reference documentation. It's helping, you with the, it's helping you with the evaluation task because it's telling you this is what you use the things for. And even this is an example of what the kind of thing you might get is. So it's helping you understand and evaluate. And these are tiny examples, but hopefully they show you the point. Um, Here's an example of the second one, as in like showing you how it's used. It's, you know, this is something that ideally you can copy and paste if you want to. And again, very small example, but the more complex something is to use, the more, is, the more important an example that you can copy and paste will be, especially for that second use case of, I just want to get this working. Um, what about readme's? Um, what tasks does a readme help with? So you can think of a readme as a starting point for a lot of people, and so it has a bunch of tasks that it's trying to help the user with. Uh, it's trying to help you, firstly, identify the project, things like very simply labeling it, what is this, where am I? Um, evaluation, we talked about in reference docs, but it's the same here. Is this library appropriate for my use? Is it gonna help me with what I need it to do? Um, then, using the project, so some readme's have lots of documentation, some have very little, but an appropriate level would be at least saying, this is how you get set up with this thing. And lastly, um, doing things that are engaging with the project. So another thing that readme's can do very well is telling you, if you want to contribute to this, where do you go? So those are the kind of common uses for readme. There's actually uh, a friend of mine like has set up a really, really useful checklist for writing readme's that I thoroughly recommend that will just mean you'll cover all these points uh, that will make your readme much more useful to people. Uh, so, for the previous section we talked about what kind of topics you want to cover. This is a bit more about the angle of approach that you take. Um, because what you write in your documentation is obviously affected by your viewpoint of what you understand, what you know already, and what you think is easy and hard. But you are writing for your audience and not for you. Um, and so if your documentation is going to be effective for them, you need to find a way to get out of your head a bit. Um, when I was researching for this talk, I browsed through quite a lot of Haskell documentation, and I think this was probably my favorite example that I can And And my background isn't in Haskell, but, and by the way, this wiki page also is completely unhelpful. <laughs> I'm trying to understand what was going on here. Um, so this is something, I think this is an extreme example of something that's not written in a way that's easy for other people to understand. Uh, yeah. Uh, I find it interesting to, to, to evaluate this because mm -hmm. uh, this library might actually not even have been written for users to use and solve uh -huh. problems with. It actually is much more of an endeavor on, okay, how, how can I categorize a particular sort of set of objects? They're it's inventing. Yeah, they're inventing your own language, mm -hmm. or it's not your own, I mean, mm -hmm. this language of how you can talk about recursion schemes something that's established and shared by a particular mm -hmm. group of people. Oh, very small, probably. Um, so I totally agree with uh, this perspective. If the task mm -hmm. is for people to 
use this mm -hmm. in practical software? <laughs> no. Right, <laughs> and, but and, you, you're and saying it has a different purpose. If the task mm -hmm. is to teach somebody about so all the different shapes <laughs> the curse <laughs> schemes could take, um, but this is also not close. Yes. This is quite a way as well from like the rest of everything in recursion schemes, right? I mean, a, a lot of recursion schemes yeah. is, is quite sensible, and then you just scroll back, scroll to the bottom of like the basic folder ball uh, thing, and you get oh, and, and here's the thing. It's not. Yeah. It's not even that there's a you know histomorphism section above that that would like just yeah. Right. I think this is the thing. Even in that con one of the problems with this is there's just no context. It's just like here's a term. And if you're familiar with that term, you're going to be fine. But otherwise, there's very little that will help you, like. But you're probably going to need for use it if you're not familiar with the term. I think that's the argument. Well, maybe, but I have no idea. No. Yeah, and, and yeah. also to be clear, so yeah. I, I don't. Know. Yeah. This just popped out to me. If I went through that lens, yeah. um, that there might be a different task involved. Mm -hmm. I told no, you, I mean, I this is yeah. a good example, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm sorry, I don't want to... No, 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 totally. Push yeah. No, and this is it. The thing is, I'm when, and as well, like the examples I've given in this talk are of, like the ways that I've conceptualized tasks, but for any individual thing, you, like, you'll have a better understanding, hopefully, of what someone might be trying to achieve with it, and so you'll know better what their tasks are, and so what information will help them with that. So I, I think one problem, of course, is also that even though something like this might be written with, uh, in this case, one particular user in mind, uh, eventually functions like this might actually uh, pop up in your code base because somebody actually found, oh, this concept is very useful. And then when you want to uh, look at what that function actually does, then you are like, as the essentially third person who encounters <laughs> these functions, then you are getting into this situation. So in general, I agree with what you said, Simon, but um, I think that many things that were originally designed as like a research concept eventually just happen to be very useful and people start using them, and then this is just the deal breaker. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Actually, in, in my mind, what just popped up is sort of a label of ready for industry use. <laughs> when, <laughs> since when does anybody care about that when industry <laughs> thinks about in projects? <laughs> I have maybe a less esoteric example where I know that some people are using lenses and think they are awesome and actually use them in production and I'm, I'm like, what are lenses? I'm a beginner and I can't read this page. Yeah, <laughs> so and I think it's, it, yeah. That those problems exist. Exactly, and I think it's providing like, even giving you a breadcrumb trail of, if you, so I'll show you some examples of this, it's like, if you don't know what this thing is, here's where you like. I'm not writing this. I'm, you know, I'm not writing this with your mind. But if you go away and read this other stuff, at, at minimum, this is what will help you understand it. It's kind of giving people that, just giving you somewhere to go. I think my problem with this, and I should have shown you the other page as well to prove it, but it really is the fact that it's a dead end if you don't know where you are. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally believe yeah. you. Um. Has this been written on April 1st, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> as far as I know, this is genuine. Um, but yeah, so this section of the talk is going to be about avoiding getting into this situation. Um, so, you are not your user. And this is really, really, really important because even no matter how much you think you might be like your user, like you're writing software for people exactly like you, you have to recognize that users are different to you in two major ways. Like, firstly, in the way that we were talking about here with beginners, you know, or with someone who doesn't have your exact background, might not have done the same course at university that you did. There are a lot of different pieces of background information and understanding that you have that you have to at least recognize and think about whether or not the people that you're writing for also understand those things. But there's a much deeper way as well in which you're not your user. Like I've, and I've worked with plenty of people who are like, oh, but we're writing software for you know experienced software developers. They should know about this stuff. Um, and even if that's the case, if you're writing this, you're almost you know you're very likely the person who's been working on this software as well, which means that you understand it from the inside out. And I mean literally from the inside, looking outwards. And you have to understand that your user is on the outside and they are looking inwards. And there are a bunch of, you have, which means you have completely different perspectives on what is actually important to you. So if you're inside, you spend a lot of your time thinking about how this thing works, what's, how, what's the best way to design it, uh, you know, how to do that bit of it well. And actually a lot of that, apart from the fact that it needs to work, isn't ultimately generally that relevant to the user. If you've done your job well, you don't need to tell them about the implementation of something in order to help them get the job done. Um, and it's 
I feel like it's fairly usual to say like, it's not right to make someone understand the internals of what you've done before they can actually get going with it. Um, I feel like the extreme version of this is requiring people to read your source code in order to work out what, you know, how they're meant to use it. Um, I don't know if any, has anyone here ever attended uh, a user testing session, like where, where a piece of software you've worked on, like someone has used it in front of you? I don't know. Okay, there we go. We've got one person. So I used to I used to go to a lot of these, and they're really valuable because you will not believe how much, even with someone who is very intelligent and knows the area very well, how much of a gap there is between what you know and how you know how to use something and what they are. And if you ever get the opportunity to do it, I really encourage you because it's something that you really won't believe how, how different it is, how different their experience of using something is to what you expect. Um, but what, I guess, the summary of what I learned from user testing is that you really need to work out, or at least make an attempt to work out, what, makes, what are the things that make sense to you because you already know how they work, but that won't be so clear to other people. And the basic way you can do this is by trying to go through and work out what your assumptions are. Um, so this is an example that I, I really like in terms of, so this example is talking about, it, it gives you a brief introduction that says, okay, if you've used these things before, these are the kind of things that will help you be familiar with. So it's very, this, so it's very explicit about the kind of experience that will help you understand it. And then there's a nice thing of saying, doesn't just say, oh, these will help you. It's like, if you don't have these things, you know, it doesn't mean like, go away, you're not welcome here. Um, there are some other things that you, you know, we're going to explain to you how this works. And these are the things that you'll need to understand in order to make this work. So this is an example of thinking about what kind of things might be similar and what kind of things might be uh, assumptions of design patterns that you use that will help people understand what's going on. Um, Another way to get out of your head is to think about, like I said earlier, internal and external information. Making sure you're aware of when you're writing something for someone, is this going to, is this information that will help them with that task? Because that, holding on to that idea of a task will help you work out whether you're just telling someone something because you're proud of this thing that you wrote, uh, or whether you're actually telling them because it will be useful to them. And this is, this is this idea of minimalism, right? You only need to write down what is actually actively useful to people. Um, Wiffum. Nobody, anyone heard of Wiffum? This is great. This is, like, this is one of my favorite writing tools that I learned early on as a technical writer, and it's been useful in so many places because it's a great way, apart from the else, of checking your assumptions. So Wiffum, what stands for what's in it for me? And it means ask yourself the question, Essentially, why should someone read this? Or why should someone use this? Why should they care about this? What is the value for them? For example, if it's a library, why should someone use their library? What's it going to do for them? And so you can say, I mean, this is like a standard thing. If you have a description in your package, the most important thing you need to tell someone is what it is going to do for them. What is its purpose for them? And this is something that basically it's an example of you doing a bit of hard work to make things easier for countless people who might have to read this later, because otherwise they're going to have to dig through all the information you've given and try and work out, rather than you just telling them what um, So ironically, this is a bad example from a docs packet, <laughs> a documentation tool, uh, but this is, you can see what they're talking about, is they say, this is a thing, uh, and then they jump immediately into, this is, for, this is why we designed it, this is what we were thinking about. And there is some information here. They actually say further down in this first point, this is what Havoc lets you do. But you have to, like, instead of being able to skim read, which our brains really like to do, we want to be able to pull out information really quickly, this is making you dig through the entire paragraph to get at the thing that's relevant to you. Um, this is just another example of a, of a WIFM on the smaller scale, which is saying, this is what this is for, and in particular, this is the situation in which you might want to use this particular thing. So, for, so WIFM is useful in two ways, right? Firstly, you have to work out what the answer to that question is, uh, what's in it for your user, and then tell them, like literally just tell them the answer to that question. And so much of the time, this is a, we just don't do this, like we forget to say, oh, why, why is this important? And giving people that information up front uh, is really, really helpful. It, it kind of, it's like a shortcut, so I don't know if you've ever read like a really long technical blog post and you're halfway through and you're like, I'm not really sure like 
what the point they're trying to make here is. Often it's because they haven't told you up front what the important information they're going to be talking about is. If you know what you're looking for, your brain is so much better at pulling out the relevant information and skimming past what you don't care about. But it means you have to tell people up front what it is, you know, what is important about what you're saying. Um, oh, this is an, another example of in WIFM, but a slightly different way. So this, this WIFM is not just telling you, so firstly they say what this package is useful for, but then they go one better, which is they say, what is this documentation for? So not only telling someone what the package is good for, but actually what will you get out of reading this page. And again, it means you can tell what it is you're meant to be looking for here. Or alternatively, if this wasn't what you wanted, then you can go somewhere else. Um, code examples came up tons and tons in that state of Haskell survey. This is the single biggest thing you can do to help your users, especially in reference books. Um, and it really is, like, it's not easy to come up with good code examples. Uh, the only thing I can say is, you know, try and think hard of what a sensible use case is. It doesn't have to be the perfect use case. It doesn't have to be the ideal way of using something. It just has to be a good example that would be a reasonable example that can get you going. Um, I'm also a massive fan of code comments and code examples, and the reason is this: like, one, there aren't that many sort of absolute truths, but I think one truth of like how developers use documentation is they skim straight to a code example and copy and paste and go and start writing it. That's like a thing that everyone does. Sorry. Yeah, there was one of the example, uh, questions I had. So you said mm -hmm. it's useful to actually tell people what's written in your documentation. Yeah. And so my common use case is I actually don't read the first paragraph of the documentation. Yeah. So I kind of like did jump in the search engine mm -hmm. jumps me to somewhere. So how, how often do I need to repeat what's actually there? Is there some kind of recursive structure that's like <laughs> yeah. or so, so you can't fix the fact that people don't read by trying to make them read more, unfortunately. Um, so I think there are two answers to that. One of them is around structure and heading, so helping people pick information out even when they're skimming, which is something I'm going to handle in a minute. Um, the other answer, I think, is you do just have to accept that you're writing something and many people will skip past it, maybe come back to it later when they can't work out what's going on. But this is one of the reasons that code examples are so important because if, if people use nothing else, they will go to the code example. And this is when the, so this is why code comments are so great, right? So if you have an example that is commented, explaining the important, you know, summarizing the important points that you would have put elsewhere in the documentation, someone comes in, they copy it, they paste it, they go somewhere else. They might read it then in the IDN or they might come back later, but the documentation has stayed with them and it's the kind of thing that people tend to are more likely to actually look at because it's within the context of what they're trying to get done. So it's like, I mean, the answer is no, you can't win, but you can do your best, I guess, with that one. So should you embed links back to the page that you took an example on in every example? So that people Only if you can make sure they don't break. <laughs> because broken, because then it's then it's not helping you. Um, this is like a really tiny example. I thought it was mostly cute because of the Marvel reference, but um, it, I think I liked this because it was it was giving a function that's like, okay, I can see what this might do, but not necessarily why, and giving you a cute example of this is a case in which it, it's giving you something a bit more concrete that makes a bit of sense. So you know, it's a tiny code example, but I think it's a I think it's a nice one. Um, and also, I think it's an, an, it's an explanation that's easier to, of what this function does, that's easier to read than the text above it. If you just look straight to this, you can see exactly what's going on. So in some ways, it's a better way of understanding it than the explanation is. But it gives you, it gives those two par parallel paths. Um, one last way to try and get out of your own head is really, like, it's, especially if you've written something, I've talked a lot about reference documentation here. If you write any documentation that is a set of instructions, it is so, so important to actually run through and check this, especially if you've written something like a tutorial. Running through and making sure you've, you've put everything in the right order and that everything actually works, especially like installation instructions. Try it on a clean machine because like, you know, so many of the, so much of the time this is when something breaks and it's a real pain. Um, even better if you can get someone else to invest the time, especially someone who doesn't know this super well, getting feedback out of this is like the most, is the most useful thing you can do to improve your jobs. Okay, so we've come through a lot of stuff, now we've got to actual writing. So we've talked about the topics that you want to cover and what kind of angle you might take on those, you know, the foundational things. But now you do actually have to write something down as well. 
Um, and there are three main things I'm going to talk about here. So firstly, uh, a bit again, the blank page problem, how you actually get started once you've decided your topic. Um, then talking about structuring, so this is the point about how you get people to skim read, structuring your documentation for readability um, that makes it easier for people to actually take information in. And finally, some, top, some tips for actually writing more effectively, more clearly, more concisely. Um, and we'll talk about concisely because I know you'll object to that. Um, so, when you, if you, especially if you're writing something uh, like a bigger document piece, a bigger document, so a readme or a tutorial or a walkthrough or something larger like that, um, there are three things that can happen here. So, the first one is to start with the outline. Uh, I actually like to do this for my university essays because I would sit there being like, well, I know I have some information in my head, but it's very hard to get down on paper, especially if you just try and write it from the beginning and go through. So instead, if you work out what are the main points that you want to make. We talked about user tasks. You know, If you've thought about your user tasks, you should already know what these things uh, should be. So you can write them out as bullet points. Essentially, you're writing the table of contents of your document and maybe some very brief notes about what should go in, in each section. But once you know what you're meant to cover, I find that actually that's the hardest piece of work and, I, and the rest of it is just actually mechanically typing it out. Um, the second thing here is that ordering really helps. And I feel like, I always feel like this should be more obvious, especially for programmers, but it seems to be something that like messes people up a lot. It's making sure you're telling people to do something in the order that actually makes sense. You know, things that making sure that they um, should understand, the things that they need to understand first come first. I think. There's like, this is something you see all of the time. Sorry, you can't see. And it's like, if something, if there is something that will massively mess you up if you do it wrong, or like a massive caveat that you need to know about, tell people before they do it, because what people do is they come in here and they go, oh, some instructions, and start following them. And if the problem is on like step three, then you know, your, your warning down at the bottom is completely useless. So if there's something someone needs to know first, tell them first. Um, finally, this is something that has come up a lot when, so often I'll, if, when I was working with people to write documentation, it would be, often they would say, I don't really know how to like, how to put this or what I'm actually meant to be saying here. And so what we'd usually do is we'd sit down and I'd say, okay, tell me. And I would say 90% of the time they literally, they just said something and I was like, well, if you write that down, that's your documentation, you're done. It sounds weird, but so my personal theory about this is that we do a lot more speaking than we do writing, and so it's much easier for us to just start talking about something and work it out as we go than to write it down on paper. Um, it's also a really, it can be a really good way of making sure. So writing is often easier to read if it's a bit more natural sounding, a bit more conversational. So if you read something out, you can work out whether or not it sounds really weird and it's really hard to get through, or whether it's actually something a bit more like a normal person would say. Um, more, more or less. Um, okay. Yeah. Writing for readability. So our brains really, really hate walls of text. I'm actually going to move off this slide so you don't try and start reading that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. That was so. That's an extreme example of a wall of text. But it's one of these things that if something is is chunky like that, it is very, very hard for for you to break it down and pull information out of it. And there are lots of things you can do to make it much easier to pull information out of text for your readers. And I mean, I'm going to go through a bunch, but essentially anything that provides visual variety is going to help you. So this is exactly the same content on both sides. Um, you're probably going to think this is a bit weird, because the side with structure is obviously way, way longer than the side with none. But this is much harder to get information out of. Um, whereas this is something that you can read basically at a glance and skip to what you need. So things that this is doing, one of the main things you can see, this uses headings. And the headings give you this summary that let you skip to the information you actually care about. Um, so things like headings both provide structure and break it up, but also mean you can just look at the bit that you care about or run down the page and know what's there and, and you know, you might come back to it later. But, um, but you've taken in roughly what the information you have here. So headings are great. Um, breaking up the paragraphs, and a good rule of thumb is having one idea per paragraph, 
and that will allow you, and, and really like a small idea, because that will allow you to keep it coherent, but also not end up with a big block like this. Um, using code formatting is obviously great, and again, like having code examples is something that lets people skip to the bit that's usually the bit they care about. Um, links are also fantastic if you can provide relevant links to stuff. Not only do they provide visual interest, but they often mean that you can not repeat yourself over and over. You can have something that's in the relevant place and then link to it from this way. Um, this is further down on the same page. Another thing I wanted to show you was using lists. Lists are brilliant. We're really good at reading them. Uh, so in this left hand side you have a list but it's really difficult to pull out the information about what you care about whereas if you break it up in that way it's much much easier to take in at a glance so often if you find yourself writing something with a few commas you probably just want to turn it into a list basically all the time and it's almost always the right thing to do um, what was the other thing there uh, yeah so oh which type of list to use when so you have unordered lists bullet points, and then you have ordered lists, like numbered lists. Um, unordered lists are for when the, the order doesn't matter. So, you know, something like this, these can happen in any go. The main time you really want to use a numbered list is when you're telling someone to walk through some steps, and this is something I get really frustrated about because people write steps all the time with bullet points, and it makes it really hard to, if something is a, numbered, is a list of numbered steps, you can tell, like you look at this and you know that this is a set of stuff that you need to go through. And it also makes it much easier to tell your progress. So if you're writing steps, definitely, definitely put them in a list, but put them in a numbered list. And it will be, this is just something that will make your documentation much better. Um, so yeah, for the things that you can do to make your writing more readable, use headings, use lots of headings, use more headings than you think. Um, headings are great. Bullet points and numbered lists. Um, using bold, bold maybe sort of not so often with code formatting can really help break things up. Um, breaking up paragraphs, one idea for par ah, sentences. Um, so this is just a matter, no matter what your intelligence level, people find it harder to read sentences that are longer than about 25 words. Like it's just hard for, your, for you to process. So it's not like, it's not, that's not an absolute rule. But if your sentence is getting pretty long and you check and it's over 25 words, 25 words, that's a good point to start about breaking. You've probably got too many ideas in there anyway, so think about breaking it up either into a list or into a, two shorter sentences. Um, one last thing, because I noticed this on Stackage, uh, was that sorry, page width. So if a line is longer than about two alphabets, so what, uh, 52 characters? No, that's not right. Yeah, I think it's two alphabets. Um, it is much harder, again, for you to take in that information. It, you know, that, that really wide line rip uh, is quite difficult. So obviously you can't do this on something like that, but if you ever build your own doc site or are hosting it somewhere else, please keep the line, line width much narrower because, again, it will make it much easier for you to take stuff in. I think... 52 characters No, that sounds short. really short. That's like below in code. No, I'm... I think it's 60, 60 to 60. 80 sometimes. That's really? not, that's not... That seems very short. I think no, it is. Yeah. It is true. Yeah. I think that problem can easily be addressed by resizing the browser window. Yeah. Well, that, that's what I often find myself doing, or like getting out pro dev tools. Well, yeah, there's a people who <laughs> say, oh, my horizontal uh, monitor is wide, so I'm going to yeah. need all the white space yeah. to fill it. And especially yeah. if you have type signatures in there, you they want a really wide yeah. line. Right, and that's it. I think the thing is, maybe for a line of code, you want it all in one line and it's easier to see. But, no, okay, maybe not. Um, but I, I mean, try, try and experiment, like have a play around with resizing your browser and see what you think, see whether you find it easier to read something that's, that's narrow. But in, in general, that's what people find. Why is it harder when it's wide? Just because of skipping the ideas? Uh, because you're trying, because you can't take it all, so it's the skimming thing. We want to try and take things in at a glance, and if it's too wide, you can't take the line in at a glance. Okay. So it's, it's harder to kind of pick the whole thing up at the same time. Yeah, a lot of this is to do, and I, I haven't talked much about the research, but there's a lot, like I can send some links around if people are interested, but essentially this is all just around how people read and what makes it easier for people to, ultimately what you want to do is allow people to skim things really quickly because that's what they're trying to do. So let them take the information out as easily as possible. And I find it harder to find the beginning of the next line when the text is too wide. Just like the when it's too long. When it's too wide, it's hard to yeah. find the beginning. Yes, that could be. Yeah, you get lost, right? 
Yeah, you kind of like leave, like you free yeah. to juice, right? And yeah. Just, oh, that's just all right. <laughs> <laughs> the same is actually true, although this doesn't tend to be so much of a problem. But the same is true if you're if it's too narrow. Like it's really hard to read something that's like you know really really narrow. But that's a bit more obvious. You just get. I think it's more annoying than anything else. You know. Back here, exactly. <laughs> um, okay. So the other thing about structure that you can do, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, but back to this idea of Wickham, what's in it for me? If you in your if you actually try and make sure you're spelling out why someone should read something, like I said, this will help them. It will help them again skim. And again, they might skip this, but it's the kind of thing that if you skim past it and take in a little bit, it will help people understand the rest of the page that you're writing. So that's true in both uh, in, t in your headings. If, if something is centered around a task and you can use, literally describe that task of doing this thing, it will help them understand what they're going to get from this particular section. And in introductions, if you have, if you say, this is what this page is about, this is what this library is about, again, helps you pull out that information. Um, this is just an example, oh, it's kind of a blurry, of um, a bigger set of documentation but has these, it's not telling you necessarily the names, but it's saying these are the purposes of these different things. And you can tell pretty easily what information you're going to get from them because they're centered around your tasks. It tells you what you're going to get. Okay. Um, <laughs> these are some guidelines emphasis on the guidelines for writing for being clear and concise. This is again about trying to do a bit of hard work that will make it easier for people to read what you've written. Um, hopefully it's obvious why you want to be clear. Um, being concise like, and being brief is a bit more controversial in that often, if you have, you, there are often things that you can cut down without losing any meaning and keep the same clarity, in which case you will help people out because there's less they have to take in. But there are some times as well it's very easy to um, to be too brief and just like cut, 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 and actually that's not so conciseness. It, as we saw in the structure example, right? Something being short doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It's easier to understand, but it often can be. Um, so, just going to go through some basic ways that you can be more concise without basically. <laughs> you're going to hate this, aren't you? <laughs> okay, this is alright. Nick, Nick likes being verse, so. <laughs> So one example that you can almost always get rid of are tautologies, which just mean saying the same things twice. So if you don't need to say this is a short summary because all summaries are short, and you don't need to say you're creating a new something because if you're creating it, by definition, it's new. So tauto, so looking out for these things where you're inadvertently repeating yourself is a way you can cut writing down without actually losing anything. Um, saying things directly. This is something that people really hate they really don't like telling people what to do, and they would much rather kind of talk around it and say, this is possible, or you might want to do this. And actually, by instructing people directly, you're doing them a favor, because you're making it much easier for them to work out what they have to do. So instead of saying, you can, X can be done, or this is possible, just telling them to do it, you know, just literally a sentence like that, is actually, will pretty, will pretty much always do the same job, and it will be much, much easier for them to understand. Um, so here's an example, just a random one. It is possible to restrict this or to do this, you know, to do the thing that you wanted to do, do this. So it's a very simple pattern. To, to do this thing you want to do, here's what you need that is often much more concise. Um, this is, so this is an example. I think I saw this seems to be like a common, uh, standard common phrasing. Um, but this module is intended to be imported. Again, this is the internal thing, right? I have intended for you to use my thing in this way. Instead of saying, this is what my intention is, just telling someone, so you should import this, or even to avoid name clashes, import this function. So to do the thing that you want to achieve, which is avoid name clashes, do the thing. And it's just a way that makes it much easier to work out what it is I'm actually telling you you need to do. What if your users think of being very rude, telling them what to do? It turns out, they do, it turns out these people just don't notice because, they, because you don't spend long enough, right? You're like, I need to do this thing. Um, uh, another version of, yeah, this is something interesting, and again, that people want, again, it's like a friendly thing, it's not wanting to be rude. People say we all the time, we do this and we do that. And the problem with we is it's not actually clear who you mean. So I think I came across in this example, and it was like, before we can run a parser, we need to do this. And because this is like written by the person who's writing this library, it can be really like unclear as a reader. Does that mean your thing is going to do that internally, or is this something that I need to do manually myself? 
So it's, it's completely fine to say we're going to do something if it is unambiguous, but in situations like this, it actually introduces ambiguity and it's really unhelpful. Um, and the same in tutorials. If you're like, we're going to walk through this thing and now we do this and now we do that, it's much more unclear what is it that I'm meant to be doing exactly and what's it that you know your tool is doing for me. Maybe you could learn to write and stuff like this and have a scientific background and that's the yes. style. I think that's I think that's common as well. Yeah. But it's just not very helpful in this context. This was an obvious but like if I look so like in Swiss German at least, mm -hmm. you're always super friendly. <laughs> yeah. Could you do this please for yeah. me? Yeah. And that's just sort of, yeah, this rudeness yeah. argument is really hard to get over. Yeah. But when I just yeah. translate this to, before you can run a parser, mm -hmm. wrap it in a parser infrastructure, full stop. Yeah. And the next time it's like, oh yeah, cool, somebody's <laughs> telling me what to do. <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same, I think it's the same in English, you know. If you go into a shop in Britain, you don't ask, give me a thing. I'm like, Ah, if, you know, would you mind if I took a thing, kind of, you know, if you're not too busy, and... <laughs> I would be so, so I would love to see the experiment run for control this rudeness of documentation by nationality. <laughs> because, I mean, Germans are like, yeah. you're cleaning beer. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say, actually, this pretend you're German, my grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> or conversational, but I think there's a difference between, like, I don't know, like contracting, ca like, cannot to can't, or, you know, various contractions which you wouldn't use in formal writing, but in documentation are completely fine, and they're just the way you speak. But it's not, it's, you can be friendly, but also brief. I think that's kind of, you kind of, if you try and think of someone that you like, but you also don't want to waste their time, that can be, like, a good, like, how you might explain it to them at that point. Is it a bit like a write, like, how you would talk to them? Like, I would not yeah. say before we can run a partner, I would yeah. tell you. Well, imagine, like, if you're sitting next to some, you know, I think you might, I mean, you might speak around it a little bit more, but if you're sitting next to someone and they're at their computer and you're telling them instructions, you say, okay, so now you do this, so now you do that, like, you know. And, and it might be that you speak in a more friendly way, but actually you find that probably instructing someone in that way doesn't feel rude. It just feels like this is a situation in which I'm telling you how to do this. So, yeah, this is something as well, like, Reading something out loud for how it sounds is just, if you if you don't mind spending the time doing it, it can be a really good way to kind of make things work. And we're not in like <laughs> Another way that I like to think about it is, um, I imagine that I was in an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm the tech guy, and Arnold is in the chopper, and he needs to have the instructions on how to use it, and then I think, if I was on the phone now, I'd have to tell Arnold right now how to do it. Would this be the most efficient way? And if, if this is the case, then my documentation is concise, but he must still be able to uh, use the helicopter correctly. <laughs> this That's amazing. Arnold. I love that. That's <laughs> There's actually a really interesting, there's a website called Voice and Tone which talks about what kind of things it's appropriate to, to write in user interfaces in different user contexts and it's like, for example, if something has failed, like, yeah, you're thinking like someone is super stressed out, maybe the bill, you know, something just broke on them, it's a really bad situation, at that point you're like, you are brief, you know, you're not going to, like, because anything you say that's like talking around it is just going to annoy people. So, so what's that website? Uh, voice and Tone. Um, so the thing, I think the we kind of feeling that comes from tutorials where it's kind of written in a way it's like we rediscover this concept. Mm -hmm. So like the, the parser it, thing, yeah. oh, we're inventing this parser mm -hmm. and now we have to do this, now we have to do this. Yeah. But uh, as you said, as, mm -hmm. as something to get, to just use it and not reinvent it, yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's uh, less useful. I think as well, there are ways of being, of giving that friendly, um, like, walking you through something without being confusing and the problem here is just when it's not if you don't know what you're meant to be doing and if it's confusing then it just doesn't help that you're being friendly right as well yeah. in the image you explained before and really it, uh, the think about you explaining it to a co-worker yeah i actually realized that when i was thinking about documentation i was thinking about explaining it to a stranger hmm. and to a stranger i'm much more formal <laughs> yeah. so i really yeah. need to establish first yeah. that okay it's a friend of mine let me just tell him I think as well, I mean, if you've literally, I mean, literally what you're doing when, write, when you're writing documentation is you are talking to another person. And if you, like, they're not, you know, in this case, they're probably, I mean, technically they're a stranger, but you're like, oh, you're, you know, 
you're someone who's interested in the same things that I am, you know, so you have something in common with this person, you, you know, you feel positively towards them, it's not like a, an awkward conversation. Um, also, the thing you said about open plan offices, now that's great, that's how you advertise your documentation, right, by reading it out loud and you share it with everyone. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I've, I've mentioned this a little bit before, but another way of instructing uh, is making sure that your headings are centered around those tasks. Again, this is kind of a bit about thinking internally. It's really tempting it, in big you know, sets of documentation is you might want to structure, you, you have your headings, you think, of, oh, this is this bit of my code, this is the builder or the parser or whatever. And actually, it's just worth thinking about if there's a more appropriate title that instead of saying, oh, this is this bit of my code, say, thinking about this is what the user is trying to get done, it will just make that, essentially it's another instruction, it will make them e it easier for them. Um, this is another tool uh, that helps people parse your sentences. Putting, like front loading them, so putting the most important bit of information first. So for example, if there's a condition that's like, in this situation, do this. If you're not in this situation, you don't need to read the rest of the sentence, so put the condition first, and it gives them the option to skip if they don't need. In the same way, if there is, the, so, the, so for users, for example, the most important bit of information, so you can use A to do B, where A is the thing in your software and B is the thing your user is trying to get done. For them, the thing that they're trying to get done is the most important thing. So if you put that first, you're targeting the most important information there. And again, it lets them skim. Um, don't <laughs> saying stuff is easy is something that people really like. Again, I think it's being friendly. It's like, oh, this will be fine. This will be, and it's it's almost always unhelpful uh, because if it is easy, then you don't need to tell them because they'll just find it easy. And if it's not easy, then it's like, oh, great. Well, now I'm really stupid. You know, I can't even do this simple thing. So saying things are easy. Saying things are simple. Uh, it just isn't helpful. So just just don't do it because it, there's this idea in writing of. Um, showing not telling as in you demonstrate something rather than being like i'm really awesome you show that you're awesome by you know doing something great so in the same way if something really is simple you don't need to tell people about it because it will be obvious itself it's self-evident another example that is uh, using the word just which is just yes just just just, do. just follow these simple steps yes, you know, like 10 hours later <laughs> um, that's all right, really, isn't it? It's just delineating the fact that there's something there and it's not nothing, right? So, <laughs> um, so one last, this is the last thing about uh, writing. And one of the things that I've found is like, so I've like, because I do this professionally, I do a lot of editing and there's like a bunch of processes that I go through that I think are just, if you haven't done that, I'm not necessarily used to. So what I'm going to do now is run through an example of what editing something looks like. Um, and yeah, basically the idea of what you're trying to do is you're just trying to cut to the core of what you're saying and take out anything that's not adding anything. So we're going to do this with a totally stupid example uh, of Waitrose is a posh British supermarket. Um, and this is something that they, this is a phrase that they have on their pack of broccoli. So, for the, for the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to pretend that this is something that conveys some information that we're trying to make it convey that information in the most clear way possible. So, so firstly, we've got our fundamental belief is that few things in life are more important than the food that you buy. Uh, good quality is essential. Okay, so how do we start editing this down? Well, firstly, so good quality, when you say good quality, that's a tautology, right? Because it just when you say when you describe something as quality, it means the same thing. So we can actually cut out good, and it will still mean the same thing. So quality is essential. Um, here's another thing that actually we can cut out. Few things in life. I mean, it's kind of again, what does it add? Everything is in life, really. So it doesn't really <laughs> add that much. So again, we can take this out. Okay, we're getting a bit short. So that's good. We're almost at three lines. Um, our fundamental belief is, I mean, it's a stronger way of saying we believe, but ultimately what it's communicating is, this is something that we believe. So we can cut that down to just say, we believe. Three lines. So another thing that kind of, a bit like in life, rather than saying the food that you buy, I mean, especially 
this is in the context of a supermarket, so the food that's there is the food that you're buying. So again, the fact that it's that you're buying it doesn't really add anything to this construction. So we can take this out as well. Um, few things are more important than food. It's really just, you know, ultimately what it's saying is food is important. <laughs> again, it's, you know, there's a slight nuance loss, but it's still ultimately communicating roughly the same thing. Okay, two lines, good. Um, <laughs> quality is essential doesn't really communicate anything. Like, it's just a truism, so it's not really doing anything for our communication here. So that's something I think we can just completely take out. Um, <laughs> this is my, I mean, this is Waitrose, this is their food packet. Of course they're saying what they believe is their thing. So it doesn't really, you know, they can just state it, right, without saying we believe. It's just, you know, it's what they, they believe to be a fact. And really this isn't actually saying. <laughs> <laughs> anything to communicate and so it was possible to edit it down to nothing. Um, but hopefully that shows you kind of what are the things you might start to look for when you have something very long and you might want to try and like, um, yeah. And in this case it, it does, there is also a serious point here which is when you're writing something make sure you are actually saying something uh, rather than just like a bunch of nonsense. So. That's why you're a technical writer, not a marketing. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't ask me to write like, you know, a blog post or something. It's, yeah, it doesn't go that well. I think but technically the label should just have broccoli on it. Would be much more helpful. But it's kind of obvious. It contains broccoli. broccoli. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some people don't know what broccoli is actually. No, that's true. I think labeling labeling things is okay. Labeling things is useful. So I think yeah. what's happening here is the Trump technique. You give the skim readers every word they want to see. So for everybody, for some people they are like life. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Quality. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. And that, that's what you're doing here. You, I you, know not about it. Important. 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 Yeah, yeah. But what? But what? So what? What that is actually doing is it's it's not conveying information; it's conveying an impression. It's like, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> food, and that's what it's really doing. It's, it's just hacking your subconscious. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like there are some words that you like. Quality, quality is good. Yeah, it's just it's conveying the waitress ethos, which is like <laughs> one of the reasons that people shop at waitress. <laughs> I'm a waitress person. Ergo, I shop at Waitrose, and I appreciate that you know Waitrose writes flowery language about broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be very interesting now to have a talk where somebody explains how you write that kind of stuff. Why this actually is the right thing to do if you want your product to be I, bought at higher percentage. I would go to that talk. Yeah, the thing is, I can't, I can't do sales. Like the only, sorry, the only kind of sales I know how to do is like. I'm telling you the properties of this thing, and obviously they're good, so you want this thing. Like I don't know, I can, I don't really know how to do the like bigging stuff up, and that's a real skill that I yeah don't really have. I would be quite interested. In, yeah, if you can find a speaker to come and teach us a lot of stuff. <laughs> you just need to play the uh, play the slides backwards, and you see how it's. What would be cool? Kind of <laughs> Who would want that talk? <laughs> <laughs> All right, small circle. Yeah. Um, so the last point I want to make on writing is the other thing is it can get easy to be, it can be easy to get caught up in the idea that it has to be exactly right and actually it doesn't really, all of this stuff is just kind of designed to help you make stuff a bit better but it doesn't really matter if something is perfect or not. This idea of, you know, all you're aiming for is to communicate well and if you haven't said that in the most concise or the most clear way, it doesn't quite matter as long as you have communicated effectively. So that's the goal here, rather than some kind of idea of perfect. And, and this is why like, I actually, I don't care all that much about typos um, in documentation. That kind of seems kind of weird, except typos look a bit embarrassing, but they often don't stop you from understanding you know, a, a piece of writing, especially if there's just like one. So actually it's something that kind of looks like it's a marker of quality, but it doesn't actually stop you from comprehending something. Aiming for communication rather than perfection is definitely the goal. Right, we're almost there. Um, two more fairly brief things, uh, which are a bit more mechanical. So one of them is um, where you want to actually set this up within the Haskell stuff. Uh, so there are three things that seem to be really important uh, for like a library. Firstly, having a decent description. 
uh, about what the library is for. Like, this needs to be really brief in order to be useful. So just saying, this is the most important thing. Um, this is, yeah. Will this be, you're, you're trying to answer the question of, will this be useful for you or not? Um, it's super important to have a readme, and I think I've seen a lot of libraries that just have, like, a very minimal, like, hi, contact me at this email address or something, you know, it's just like, here's some details to maintain it. Uh, I really strongly encourage a looking up that, I'll, I'll share the slides around after, but looking up that readme checklist and following that, it makes such a difference and it doesn't, it isn't that much effort to go through. But also going through some basic documentation of your thing. Um, like it provides a really nice starting point and it seems like it gets automatically pulled into places so it, you know, you don't have to repeat yourself because you know it's going to be shown in various places. Um, giving at least an overview of like the main bits of usage I think is, is great for readme. Um, the alternative is doing something like putting a lot of that into your into your module, so having a lot of kind of background information um, in, that you pull in through Haddock, but you know, I think the readme is shown in more places and so it's more broadly useful. And also reference documentation of Haddock is also important, trying to, for everything that you have, at least trying to provide a brief summary of like, why, like, how do you use this? Why is this useful for you? That's what makes a big difference. Um, for anything moderately complicated, you might want to consider having a separate documentation site. Um, I am not going to. I haven't talked really about structuring. Uh, like, if you have lots of different pages of documentation, how to put them together, and that's because that, like, that's information architecture, and information architecture is really hard. And I could probably do a talk this length just on information architecture, but it's something. Uh, if you ever find yourself doing it, drop me a line. I'm sure I can try to help. Um, in terms of tooling for that kind of stuff. I like Sphinx and read the docs are often quite an easy way to get something up and running. I actually personally can't stand Sphinx for their aesthetic reasons, but I'm not going to rant against it because I feel that my reasons for disliking it are really unfair. So Sphinx is totally fine. Things like a basic static site generator, Hugo or Jekyll or something and GitHub pages will also do you just fine. It's like, you know, this stuff isn't. You just want a vehicle for text, basically, that's reasonably well structured and doesn't have a page width this point. Um, yeah, and that's, um, yeah, as I said, you can also put more. If you feel like there's more to be said inside your modules, that's great too. But ultimately, this is going to vary depending on what it is you think your users are, are going to try to get done. So I can't really tell you where to put everything um, because it depends. Um, the one thing I can say, um, oh, oh, that was just an example. Of everything. That's fine. Um, the one thing that is really important here is yes, this documentation is going to be spread up in a few different places. It is so, so, so important to try and link everything together and make sure if you have if you have three different places your documentation is spread across, make sure you say just you know a link in your readme. The API documentation is here, even if it's just a link to the place that if you know the the documentation will obviously be. Make sure it's there. Things like um, I was uh, looking at a doc's website. Was, uh, this was for. Uh, Oh, I can't remember what it was, but it, it was, this was, um, they had like a header of, and it looked like these three pages are the pages on the site. And it turned out there were like five other documentation pages, and if you clicked on the FAQ, and then under the FAQ, it was like, oh, what other pages are on this site? And it was hidden under there. And it just meant that you don't know this stuff exists if it's not easy to navigate to. So make sure everything is visible, everything is linked to. If you're mentioning, if you have, say, a piece of reference documentation in your Haddock docs, and you know that there's a longer or more involved piece of documentation elsewhere linked to it, like, you know, otherwise people won't know it exists, right? So it's worth practicing, like, try searching for stuff for your own things, try and see what it's like to, is it possible to navigate between these different places? Is it obvious where the information lives? So just stepping through and trying that, like, is super important and will make a really big difference. Um, last problem, which is also a hard problem, uh, is maintenance. So you've written some documentation. How do you make sure uh, it stays up to date? And I've, yeah, I've already talked for a while, so I'm not going to go into this too brief, uh, too long. Also, because it's another. This is a problem that's really like a hard cultural problem. Ultimately, it's fine if it's just you and you, you know, you and you're, and you're maintaining your own thing, and you know when I change something, I know what documentation I need to change. Um, but it's harder if you're with a group of people. So, um, first, first and most obvious thing, I, I'm sure everyone's doing this, but you, if your doc's living in your code base, 
uh, there's a bigger chance that things will get updated at the same time. Like you don't need a separate uh, repo for your code and for like your docs website. They can live in the same place. And what that means is, you know, ideally you should be making one PR that makes a change and also updates the documentation relevant to that change at the same time. It's just something that means if you have to make two PRs, a bunch of the time you're just not going to do it because you won't get around to it. So just try and keep them all together and it will make that much easier. Um, yeah, the, so if you're making the change and you know what docs need changing, that's easy. What's harder is if there's a lot of documentation and people don't necessarily know that when they um, change something, the docs need updating, and this is basically my job, uh, is nagging people about this because it's really hard. So the smaller your project is, the easier this will be, but ultimately it relies on people being aware what things are user-facing and what the documentation is. And you kind of ultimately need a champion for this, ultimately someone who's going to make sure it happens. Um, last thing, um, and I haven't experimented with this much in Haskell, but automated testing of your code examples. The worst thing is, you know, if you come to something and you try and copy paste an example and it's broken, it's so frustrating and it's so annoying and you can fix it if you make sure your, your examples are tested, which is a Haskell library to do this and I haven't tried playing around with it, but it should be fairly doable, you just have to make sure you set up. Okay, uh, yeah, and this is something that is, you know, it's an ongoing task and it's not easy. Okay, that is everything I have to say. Um, I guess we've already had some questions already, but is there anything else? Anyone? Questions or comments, fine for you. Yeah? Um, so this is particularly relevant for Haskell tools. Mm -hmm. Um, oftentimes, self-documenting things are even better than good documentation on their own. So, for example, the, uh, I tried to create a new Haskell project, and so I used stack new, mm -hmm. and immediately it, it doesn't really help you. You kind of have to read very carefully what you do. So uh, the built-in documentation, especially for command line tools and stuff like that, uh, mm -hmm. is one which where you're directly in front of the user. So uh, you have to have very good contextual information. Mm -hmm. Like one is error, error messages. Oh, error when messages, yeah. When it be, yeah. yeah. If, so mm -hmm. if I'm using a tool, I mm -hmm. ideally I have an example in the in the use of a tool. Mm -hmm. If, for example, when you create a new Haskell library, you want to have a list of templates, it doesn't tell you. you well, I think there might be a link, and then you have to go through this one and click a few mm -hmm. places until you know what's available. Yeah. And then you get the list of templates which have some names and yeah. some very unhelpful. Yeah, and personal names like Chris Dunn. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 I guess it's good. Uh, uh, so this is something where, like Rust, for example, is really good. Okay. They're really investing in this kind of stuff. And in contrast, Haskell is quite far behind, or well, yeah. lacking. So, so I think the two major things that you can do outside documentation around, so error messages, like if you, especially like error messages often like, they'll be like, oh, there's this looking at from the very micro level. And if you can improve your error messages, be like, this is what, this is what the user might have done wrong. That's huge. Uh, the other thing is naming things, which is like, you know, that it's, if you can name things to be, and there's, I think there's this really difficult conversation around for example, naming things to do with, oh, there's this obvious mathematical concept that this, that this corresponds to. And for the people who understand this, it's a very easy way to understand it. And for people who don't, you have no idea how to even begin. But, uh, but that's a difficult one. And often, like, when you can improve naming of, of functions and things, that's, like, a huge usability win as well. Yeah. Because, you know, the better something is, is, is explained in its name, the less documentation you need. On that note, uh, a very useful thing is often when something breaks mm -hmm. and it would be fixed by just googling the code of the error, mm -hmm. then it's often easy just to link to the documentation where the thing is explained. Like mm -hmm. if you're writing the thing that throws the error code, just yeah. add the link there. Yeah, People will follow that and it's much easier. Yeah, I think that's, that's really useful. Sorry, you had a, yeah. Hey, actually, two things. Um, uh, that I consider very important. I mean, one one thing was actually on your slides, for example, explaining what the actual like performance and behavior of that function is. So if mm -hmm. you scroll up to this one page where you had um, the example with the interspersing yes. shield, right? Oh, it says the right O of n, right? Yeah. That's four characters, but it's super important because 
if this is not documented and the user uses it wrong, then things can just like break a lot because they're extremely slow, everything goes to shit and people are very uh, dissatisfied. Yeah, I think there's, I've definitely seen as well when I, was, when I was researching for this, like a lot of some people saying, this is slow in this situation and being like basically, you know, if you're going to use this thing, watch out for these scenarios that make this suddenly really unperformant and that's very, you know, it's a really nice code to you, yeah. yeah so, so that's one thing that I think that's important and the other thing that I get all the time is that uh, people don't document how their functions uh, um, happen in certain cases. So, for example, it makes a lot of sense to say when you have a parsing function that parses a string from, sorry, parses an int from a string, it makes a lot of sense to describe, okay, does this overflow or not, right? Because just yesterday, for example, I had a thing where I wanted to parse a byte string into an int, and yes, indeed the function inside byte string, um, which is like a total standard library everybody uses, this, right? It actually overflows on 32 bits. So that's really bad, and the function doesn't say it in the head and I think that simply must be, because otherwise you would just code bugs left and right. Here's the thing, and I don't know, like, I, so I think this is a thing that people don't do at all, which is come across a problem like that and think, oh, the docs are inadequate, and I know what the, you know, I, I, fa I found it out through my own trial and error. And I think people don't contribute back and then in that situation. I don't know why, I guess it's kind of a, an awkward, like, it's kind of annoying to do it at that point and you want to move on, but I wonder if that's kind of a, that's something that maybe, I don't know. No, in fact, I'm gonna encourage all of you to do that now, and then we're gonna make the so, presentation better. So one of the so. things that, that, like, the, yeah, the, the Haskell Lang website, on the documentation there, it does have a link to, you know, click here to edit this documentation. Okay, Whereas, <laughs> like, you know, with package documentation, it's sort of like, ah, well, if this got generated at all, um, like, how would you go back to, there's, there's no linking back from package documentation to, ah, here's just where you can go and edit this. And maybe that if that were like around then. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, also yeah, just a pull request awesome. away, isn't it? Right, but you have to find, you have to, you have to, if it's the header, you have to go and like, dig through the repo to find where that came from, right? Which is a little bit more effort than, I think all the I think all the Haskell Lang thing does is just it takes you to that page on GitHub, which is I just want to is Haskell Lang doesn't use header documentation or has well, modified header is, or I, I think Haskell Lang it just it has like some extra tutorial documentation, uh, oh, okay. which are just like um, markdown files on on some repo somewhere. But for those that tutorial documentation, it has links to say contribute to this, and it just takes you directly and opens a. Yeah. So it's essentially a feature request that on Haddock you could provide back links. And yeah, it, it, would, it, would, it would be, yeah. Uh, yeah. On package, I guess, that we would have to maintain a link back to the code repo and have like, uh, I it's understand like GitHub and I can go and... It must be. I mean, it's, yeah. All yeah. So we need to understand like how to do things in particular types of repos. The worst thing is, you know, when you see something that's still in a darks repo, and you're like, oh, but no, I have to go <laughs> like, dig out darks to get up. But I mean, Cabal has an extra field for the issue tracker, so I think it would already be very That's helpful true. to just yeah. have a little thing that says, like, error in this documentation, click here. And even if it just brings you to that issue tracker link, I think that would already encourage yeah. lots of people to actually That sounds like a good chance, yeah. yeah. Sounds like a Siri hack topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so one of the reasons why, um, I don't know how it came about. We, we started talking documentation. Um, I, I think Matea uh, talked about it. Yeah, I think that's my my And, and then idea. somewhere it popped up like, oh well, why would wouldn't it be possible to do a Suri hack documentation track, where, like like we had sort of the GHC track, where you have this talk. Mm -hmm. I really liked it. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> uh, as as a primer. And then sort of really focus of okay, let's make just the documentation infrastructure better for beginners. More like okay, just make the documentation better. Use this recipe, apply it. And for others, would be like okay, how could we make it put these links in order? Well, as well, I think one of the things because the thing that I used to do all the time was basically, and I do still, is like you've got this new feature or you've got this new thing you need to document it. And I'll just sit, I would sit down with someone for ten minutes, twenty minutes and just talk through and then by the end of that we usually have, okay, this is what documentation needs to be written. And that would be really fun to do with small people, so. Yeah. 
uh, I'm, so what I'm wondering is, in this room, so by a show of hands, who would definitely go? Oh, so I actually can show this. This is, I definitely go to such a workshop. This is, now um, I'll, I'll do something else. So the, where, where do you stand? I'll turn around this time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what is the question? So the question is, is it worth the effort of setting up such a doc workshop? Will there be people attending at Syria this year? Next <laughs> Yeah, my, my time is all jumping up. But the, what, the goal, is it to teach you to do this? Or to so the goal is to be like a work group and we get to do stuff together? Have the people that care about documentation, sort of in, in a similar area, um, provide context, context in that form and support, but then really have smaller groups, some people focusing on a particular library, Lens, I heard said today, like pushing the Lens documentation. I mean, that would just be a nice achievement out of, of Syriac, out of this. Or similarly, like putting in these links, again, as sort of an achievable thing. Um, now, what I noticed for Syriac is that if you just have the project proposed by individual um, participants, it's usually very small groups and everybody's sort of spread out. So I'm, I'm sort of looking for such topics there which would bring together a larger group of people and allow them to achieve something in the two and a half or two days essentially of time that is available. That is meaningful and um, people can be proud of. But it obviously also depends on what people want to get out of. And that's exactly the problem now, huh? Which is like, yeah, I, I could see myself joining now. Nah. Nephew, this is great. So, could I do the poll again? Cool, okay. That's a very cute vote that we should do such a track. Hey! <laughs> cool. Can you do another test run in our office? Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to actually. I thought it would be nice to do a session. I think it would be a good idea. Yeah. Even like if we let if let's do the office. The but then for us it just helps people to get an idea. If you, even if you don't write the yeah. documentation yourself, it's good mm -hmm. to like know how people who write your documentation yeah. approach it. There's also I kind of want like the, the stuff in this about making your writing readable. I kind of just want to tell everyone in the world this because I'm so sick of re like reading terrible emails and terrible Google Docs that are not readable at all, and it's so easy to fix. So I kind of want like everyone to at least do the like readable section. Yeah. Good. That's not a DA University session. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Right. Thank you, Beth. Yeah.